long time we don't have an episode. So again, this is Alan from uh, Flying High with Flutter. And I'm happy that we're bringing on a returning guest. It is Lucas from Widget Book. He's got an announcement on his product, which we are happy to hear about because I'm pretty excited about Widget Book. Lucas, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us more about what's going on with you and who you are and all about Widget Book. Thanks a lot for having me, Alan. I'm definitely excited to be back here. Uh, so as you mentioned, it's been a while and I'm really happy to share uh, the latest progress uh, that we made with Widget Book. I mean, you uh, just talked about it. We made an announcement already this week uh, that Widget Book Cloud is finally live. So we finally made the general publicly available launch for Widget Book Cloud. And yeah, happy to talk more both about the open source package, but also about Widget Book Cloud. I'm happy to hear that because that's something that you guys have been talking about for a long time, right? Having the cloud. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we already had the cloud available. So basically taking you back on the journey of Widget Book, first call was 2022. That's where we started out with Widget Book. And then very quickly had the first paying customers on uh, the cloud, on the hosted solution. But back then the focus was really to, first of all, have a great and solid open source package for the Flutter community. And we only had the first version of Widget Book Cloud out in the open um, in a closed beta with paying customers just to make sure that we, on the one hand, get really serious feedback from customers because what we wanted to avoid is building something that in the end doesn't really solve a problem. And having paid customers early on definitely, first of all, gave us as a team the confidence, okay, we're really onto something and we are not only building something that works well for us. Uh, I mean, that's always uh, what I see where developer tools usually excel at is that first of all, you start solving your own problems, which is definitely great, but uh, you should really soon also start solving other people's uh, problems. And uh, fortunately, that worked pretty quickly for us. But we, first of all, had to kickstart the open source package um, and make that really solid. And fortunately, that worked out very well uh, during the last year. So taking you back on the journey in 2023, in the beginning, there was a big Flutter conference, Flutter Forward. And here it was amazing that the Google team featured us live on stage during that conference and afterwards we could announce that the open source package is already stable and usable. So there was a time when we launched the second version or V2 of the open source package. And ever since widget book in the open source package became really popular and became one of the default tools for Flutter developers. And once that milestone was reached for us, then we could finally focus on widget book cloud more basically. Last summer, first we released Widget Book 2, then we released Widget Book 3, and with Widget Book 3, the open source package was really usable. And afterwards, we could focus on Widget Book Cloud, and then we had the chance with our uh, paying customers to work very closely together, not only on the package, but on the cloud. And I mean, we're going to jump into Widget Book Cloud later, but it's a product that got more and more complex over the time. And uh, that's why it took a while for us to get it really usable for our customers. But now we are at that stage and yeah, our customers are really excited about the product, uh, really happy with it. And uh, that's why we were really happy to make the announcement this week that Widget Book Cloud is finally live. When did we first talk? Was it still Widget Book like 1.0 or even pre-1.0 last time? Yeah, so probably when we were talking, it was... Widget Book 1.0, as an open source package, you often end up having more and more uh, numbers and more and more major releases, even though it's technically not really version 1.0 already, just because mm -hmm. you have breaking changes. And for us, we had basically, um, when we were at pre 1.0, and we then had breaking changes, that's why we had to bump it to 1.0. Then uh, we had breaking changes again, bumped it to 2.0, um, but really with 3.0, and now we are at 3.8. And so with uh, 3.0, Widget Book was really well usable. And um, afterwards, we had the time to focus more on Widget Book Cloud. Well, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the, I mean, so it sounds like 
2.0 was, like you said, more of an API breaking change. You had to do it. it makes sense. But 3.0, you make it sound like it really is a 2.0, like a, a definitely a different version. So how would you compare 1.0 to now 3.0 now in terms of the functionality and so forth? The biggest benefit for our users is that we were able to just make WidgetBook a lot more easy to use. So in version 1.0, we didn't have something that we introduced later, which is um, which are our annotations. I can also later jump in the code and show you a bit about it, because what you can do now is you can just put an annotation in front of your widget class, and thereby we automatically generate the entire structure of the widget book for you. So basically, you wrote your widget, and you mocked the required parameters, and afterwards, you don't need to take care about setting up the structure of widget book and also maintaining the structure of widget book that is all done for you via code generation. And that is a huge help for our users. Besides just, I mean, adding the cloud ready, you guys have definitely scaled up in terms of a company since then, right? I think it was mostly you and your co-founder. But since then, you guys have hired quite a few people and even brought in talent from outside of Germany, right? You guys are still located within Germany. Is that correct? Yeah, that's true. So we started Widget Book in a smaller town in Germany. And then after we got the first customers and got our first pre-seed funding round for Widget Book, we then started hiring talent. And what is really amazing, if you are building an open source package, you are a product that is already globally distributed. And that's why uh, you are able to also hire talent globally and then we basically sat down as a team so me together with my two co-founders and we thought about which are the areas uh, where we need to expand our team now um, so which are the areas that are now really crucial for us and building a developer tool we knew very well okay uh, we first of all need to get the product uh, really uh, really in a great state and that's why we hired developers and then we basically, first of all, checked with our open source community, what are contributors and that we had in the past that we might be able to hire. But then also where we, for example, also met in person, Ellen, we are going to Flutter conferences on a regular basis. Next week, I can highly recommend it to everyone or, I mean, depends on when that episode here is going to be publicly available. Maybe that conference already happened then, but in the beginning of September, there's a Flutter and Friends conference in Stockholm and that we're going to attend again. And for us, these conferences are uh, really crucial, not only for engaging with the community, but also uh, just for um, showcasing widget book and getting early feedback. And that's why after we raised our pre-seed funding round, or pretty much even just before the pre-seed funding round, if I remember correctly, there was a Flutter conference in Norway, in Oslo, Flutter Vikings. It was amazing. And there we met Roa. You had her on the show as well. And that's how we got in touch with her. Yeah, it was nice actually meeting you in Berlin, right? I guess it's during some time when you're not actually traveling because you do a lot of traveling to get the product out there. Has that actually been useful for your strategy? Because I understand with developers, you actually have to give them your product, right? Has traveling and presenting and joining groups and presenting to the local communities, which I'm, I'm sure it's what you've been doing when you travel, you probably go to different Flutter groups and present. Is that right? Or Yeah, exactly. So um, basically, whenever there's a big Flutter conference, what we're usually doing as a team, we apply for a talk, sometimes also for a workshop. And what is amazing is that because we have an open source package that is available for free for the community, usually the organizers are really interested in having us speak at the conference because the open source package is just quite popular in the community. And that's why we're traveling to yeah mostly all the bigger Flutter conference, but also sometimes smaller conferences or also local meetups. And uh, you're right, Ellen, uh, we met here in Berlin at a local meetup. And also to, to give you a hint there, uh, so I mentioned Widget Book was started in a smaller town in Germany and now um, we moved to Berlin and uh, yeah, have the entire team here with us on site in Berlin. How is it to actually bring in town to Berlin? Because I know that Berlin, 
they're quite open and they're kind of more of like a startup hub nowadays. When I go to Berlin, sorry, when I go to, when I went the one time to Berlin, I met so many foreign people there and they were not just workers. They were also making up their own companies. So it seems like a place that's super welcoming to people outside of Germany, which is interesting. What is like the community out there like? If you're building software in Europe, usually Berlin is the place to be. So basically, Berlin is a very, very international city. I mean, it's even though it's in Germany, you don't need to speak German to be able to easily have a good life in Berlin. So everyone here uh, speaks English. Um, it's very multicultural here. On top of that, you have a lot of startups in Berlin. You have a lot of investors in Berlin. That's why you have a really vibrant startup tech community and yeah that's why berlin is quite a popular place for software developers nowadays that definitely makes sense but coming back to your strategy of you know approaching people when you go out there and you actually meet people right like it's one thing to get feedback you know online i'm not sure which one's more brutal to get it online or get it in person i'm guessing maybe when you present in person you might get a lot of nice feedback and you know the internet is the internet so when you present or people kind of comment online you probably get more brutal feedback that may or may not be useful. I mean, how do you handle feedback? Do you take it as something like, oh, these guys don't understand? Or is it more like, hmm, maybe they have an idea here and then you actually iterate and come back and you actually are going in the right direction? Like, how do you handle this kind of stuff? And how has that been getting feedback and iterating? Yeah, definitely a fair question. And I think where you're right is that people on the internet, especially on social media, they usually feel more protected and they feel like, okay, now we can really, really lash out. Uh, you see it also in discussions about politics, for example. But in our case, um, what we have been trying to do from day one of Widgetbook is we try to always run experiments and we always chose very consciously, okay, which are the people that we would like to get feedback from? So for example, if you're starting out and you're building the first version of the open source package and you're looking for feedback, it might not be the best choice to immediately ask the biggest company that just adopted Flutter for feedback because their processes might be very, very different from the processes that a small startup might have. But here it all comes down to who are the persons or the companies that are really your target user group. And for us at Widgetbook, if you're talking more about our product, we are building with the open source package a way for Flutter developers to create their own design system in code or their own Flutter widget library. And that is something that is not very relevant for small startups that just started out. So that's why for us, it was very clear that we do not need to cover their feedback or that we need to take their feedback as seriously as we should take the feedback from from others and that's why i think you need to be able to to filter uh, that feedback but the moment you know exactly okay what are the core users of your product or if your product is not there yet and you don't have you basically can't really tell what your core users are because you don't have users yet and then you basically need to have strong assumptions on what you believe are going to be your users and that feedback then is very relevant for you and the feedback from other user groups is not as relevant. Has there been any companies or people using your product in, in a way that you never imagined? My understanding of the core of the product is that you want to be able to show off widgets and then kind of add in some changes to see how does this look, right? If I go from right to left, left to right languages, et cetera, these kinds of things. But is there people using widget book in a way that you never imagined? And it's been quite surprising and maybe you're even nurturing that yeah so what has been very surprising for us in the beginning was that widget book is also sometimes used by solo developers so for us it was always very clear that widget book is going to be used by flutter teams and we then got users so for example 
one user that joined us very, very, very early on. And one of the first users that ever jumped in our Discord server is a Flutter freelancer. And usually he's the only person that is building the app and he's still using WidgetBook. And for him, the purpose is a bit different. So usually, as I mentioned, the open source package is being used to create a Flutter design system and then have a nice overview of all of your widgets and that you can then via WidgetBook Cloud easily share with your entire team and then easily run UI reviews. And for him, that use case doesn't really apply because he doesn't really have a team. So he's designing the app, he's building the app, and that's why he's also the one reviewing. Um, and that's why he doesn't really need to build a design system in the first place. But um, how he's using the widget book open source package is he's using it to build his widgets in isolation. So what you can do with widget book, I sometimes refer to it as an emulator on steroids, meaning you have the chance to build your widget in isolation and then very easily test it quickly on all the different device sizes. So in this case, let me quickly share my screen here. You have the chance here. So that's basically our open source package and you can use it here on the left side. We can see that we get a list of all of our widgets. So for example, an atom like a batch or a card you can use it also to catalog more complex widgets. In the end, not only an atom, but a molecule or also entire pages. And we can catalog those pages also in all its different use cases. So one use case for this basket screen could be empty, another use case could be filled. And you can then also interact with those widgets that you cataloged. So it's not a screenshot or a PNG file. But basically having that design system as a solo developer usually doesn't make too much sense. But what is really nice with WidgetBook is that you have the chance once your widget is in WidgetBook to very quickly test it on all your different configurations. And here we have add-ons and knobs. And what you can do with our add-ons is you can quickly test your widgets on, for example, an iPhone 13 or an iPad. You can also test it in different languages, like English or German, for example. You can test it in different themes, like light and dark mode. And thereby, you are able to very quickly see how does my widget look in all these different configurations without having to rerun the emulator over and over again and always mock certain states again. Um, so that's, that turned out to be quite useful for a lot of, a lot of our users. And on top of the add-ons, what you can do as well is you also have the chance to test your widgets also against widget-specific parameters. So with add-ons, you can basically test your widgets against global parameters of the entire app. But with the knobs, you have the chance to really go into details for your widgets. Meaning right now, we see a button here um, that has the following content, but what happens if um, the button um, would be in another language that is really long, or if for some reason the input is just longer. And what we can see then is that at some point we're gonna have an overflow here. And that is something that you can very quickly test with widget book just on the go without having to <laughs> change the input in the code. I mean, that's pretty exciting stuff, what you can do with WidgetBook. I was never really a big fan of this kind of stuff, but after I've been working on a, a website with a designer and it's been kind of a, a pain to get everything to go. But I mean, finally, you know, after actually getting a storybook going, I do find it so much easier to kind of like do this kind of stuff. What I like about yours is that you have the ability for like the designer to actually start fiddling around with things or even a developer, or, or even the boss or somebody who's not like a technical person can do it, which is even more interesting. Now, I remember we talked a couple of years ago about this, and I was interested to use it, but I had a couple of questions. As an agency, you want to be able to clear these things with your clients. Do you yeah. have this problem solved yet? It's pretty much solved with WidgetBook Cloud now. So this here is WidgetBook Cloud. And what we can see here is that we have two main features. We have builds and we have reviews. And to give the audience a better idea of basically how it works, 
and to also <laughs> maybe give an idea to anyone that doesn't see that recording but only listens to it it might be easier to follow to explain it just with an example so we have a github repository here that we used at the FlutterCon uh, conference last month and here our developer Yusef just published a new commit and we have an integration with github that allows you to upload one build of widget book for all of your github commits and because we have an integration with it you can basically access widget book cloud just via the github ui so from github you basically see an open check available that was successful a widget book cloud build and you can click on details there and it's going to open up widget book but you can also access the list of builds and that is being created that way also via the widget book cloud ui and what you can do then is you can first of all see some more information about this build but if everything is good we can then visit that build and therefore see widget book build hosted on widget book cloud and to answer your question now specifically ellen you now have the chance to just share this link with your client and then your client can look at your widget book and not only see all of your widgets, but also interact with all of your widgets and all the different configurations. And what we have specifically built for agencies is a feature that is available via the widget book cloud UI, which we call our latest build. So we have a button and it's also labeled in the same way. And how that button works is you can define a branch where whenever a new build is being published, always that latest build is linked. So you do not need to always change that link for your customer and that you would like to share your widget book with. You can just share this link with your customer once and then the customer has a chance to always see the latest build for just that branch. Now, I have another question too, because obviously not everybody mm -hmm. has iPhone 13 or a specific iPad, whatever. You can yeah. obviously add your own exactly. devices very easily, right? Yeah, exactly. So what I can recommend anyone to do is if you check out our docs on a docs.widgetbook.io, you can see the documentation for our add-ons and also our knobs. And what you can do there is you can, first of all, check each and every add-on more specifically. And what Ellen just said for the device frame add-on, for example, you have the chance to catalog whatever device you'd like to choose. So you can choose every Apple device that's available on the market. It's already pre-configured with WidgetBook, but you can also use Android devices. <laughs> we tried to catalog all the Android devices as well, but then we would need to hire more people just doing that. And to avoid that, you can also just add your own custom devices to it. And same goes for all the other add-ons. So all of those add-ons are customizable. And like you said, you can create your own too, because like you said, it's kind of limitless for Android and other kinds of devices. What about like yeah, laptops exactly. or Android TVs or, I mean, all these things they can basically yeah. be done. Exactly, everything works. So um, basically how the device frame add-on works is that under the hood, we're using the device frame package. A shout out here to Alois Daniel, who built that package that you can use within WidgetBook if you like to. And then what you can just do is if the provided devices are not enough for you, can always just define your custom device. And the only thing that is really needed for you is you need to provide the screen size. That's the most important factor here. And with that, you are very flexible. So this looks like it could also support, say, browser or desktop, this kind of stuff. So really anything. Because yeah. you can just say this anything. is the target, right? That would just kind of work. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So the only thing that I would always recommend is you also choose the target platform and so that we are also able to give you <laughs> the appropriate surrounding of your device. What do I mean with surrounding? So for example, for an iPhone 13, 
we also have the iPhone 13 or iPhone 13 case, basically. But if I choose an iPad, I would also like to see a tablet case here. I'm not expecting a phone case now. So if you're choosing for a target platform, a desktop, for example, then you would see a desktop screen in here. That's pretty cool. What else I think I saw is that you also have a way to show a widget over time, or at least between two different, like compare between like one commit and another commit. How does that look like in here? Because I'm kind of curious how that looks like. Yeah, definitely. So happy to show you. That's a feature from Widgetbook Cloud that we've been working on. And this is actually that feature that took some time to develop because it's quite complex. But how it works is, and here again, to make it easy for anyone that might just be listening. So you can all imagine we are creating a GitHub pull request. And how GitHub pull requests work is something that I don't need to explain because we're all developers. But what GitHub does really well in the pull requests is GitHub shows us what code lines were changed in this pull request. But unfortunately, what GitHub cannot show us is what changed visually for this pull request. So basically, which visual changes were caused by this pull request. And this is where Widgetbook Cloud comes into play. So if we navigate to the conversation in our pull request, we again can see all of our checks and either we can access the review just via GitHub. But what we could also do is we could navigate through the Widgetbook Cloud UI, both is possible. But if you choose to go with the a link from GitHub, we are then presented with a list of all of the changes that happened. And here, Alan, as you pointed out, we can see here on the left side, this is how my widget looked before. This is how it looks on the base build. And on the right side, we can see this is how the widget looks now. This is how the widget looks on our head build. And you can then compare the two changes and basically as a developer decide, are these changes really intentional? Did I really want to make these changes? And you are also presented with all the different screens or all the different other widgets where our changed widget was included in. So for example, this primary button here that changed was used in a couple other screens. And we can then basically see, ah, okay, does this change really make sense in all of those screens or do I need to change something? Well, I've seen this button in the corner called highlight diff because sometimes it mm -hmm. may not be very clear to people what was changed. Can you show me how that looks like? Exactly. So, I mean, if we are only seeing one component, one tiny widget, it's quite easy to see what changed, but for on an entire screen it might be a bit more difficult to spot it. And that's why if you're toggling the highlight diff button, you can then see highlighted in pink for you what changed. Can you scroll down a bit more because it's cut off a little bit on the screen? Oh, sure. Yeah, now I can see it much more clear. So it looks like it's in pink for stuff that's been removed. How about for stuff that's been added? Like, is it also like different colors or the same color for everything? Yeah, exactly. It's the same. So we basically chose pink and quite an aggressive pink to give you the best overview. Now, is that color adjustable or not? Because what if I'm doing just so I happen to do a pink background app? I mean, it's going to be a problem. Is this adjustable or no? Yeah. So in that case, it's adjustable. Yeah. Do I have the ability to choose which color or is it this automatically choosing? No, no. So, no so, so basically, by default, it's pink. But you can also change it if you like to have a different color. We tested a bunch of colors and... With our customers, we saw that the pink works best. But of course, I mean, if you like, you can also choose a very bright yellow. No, I'm kind of curious about the testing for that. How did you actually test that? Was it just like you would just present a bunch of screens and saying, like, can you see what's different? Or, you know, what was your testing process for that? It's because I was thinking more like red. Because to me, red is, I mean, obviously, this is a form of red to a certain extent. But red, it's obviously something that's supposed to catch your attention. It's supposed to be, hey, watch out, you know, something's going to happen. Or yellow but you chose pink, which is interesting. I'm curious about how you managed to get to this specific color. I'm sure you didn't go through all the different shades of pink, but just <laughs> curious about how you chose between different colors and why this one was the one 
here basically as with um, all the features that we that we built for WidgetBook, we have passionate customers that basically tell us exactly which features they deeply care about. And then we make sure whenever we start working on that feature to include those customers from the first day. And we basically created a Figma a clickable prototype first. And then we basically just had a bunch of colors defined and asked the customers if they can spot the change here. And first of all, it was without the button. They can spot the change and we chose an example where it was quite, quite hard to spot. And then we gave them the highlight diff button. And when they clicked it, they could then see what changed. And we then basically went with that color that had the best results. And yeah, that was pink. No, this is pretty cool. This is stuff that I think is great to have because like you said, it's not always sometimes easy to see what's changed. Is it possible to share this with potential clients? Yeah, definitely. So what you can do you can invite your clients to Widget Book Cloud. And when they have a dedicated Widget Book Cloud account, you can just invite them to your reviews. Maybe it's good to kind of talk a little bit more about the difference between the free version and there's still also a paid version of Widget Book plus the cloud, right? So basically the open source package, that's entirely for free. And with that open source package, you create your design system and you build your widgets in isolation. And the moment you then say, okay, I would like to collaborate with my team on Widget Book. So I would like to host my Widget Book on Widget Book Cloud. And I would like to simplify my review processes with my team. I have the dedicated review feature that highlights exactly what changed in the platform. Then you are using Widget Book Cloud and that is paid. Okay, so basically, once you start to share and, and collaborate with people together, that's when there's going to be a fee attached to it. I'm not sure how else to say that, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what we usually see is that a lot of our open source users immediately start using some sort of hosting. So either they start hosting their widget book with us on Widget Book Cloud, or they just self host it for example, on an S3 bucket. That's something that you can also do. So you can also just run it on whatever infrastructure you already set up, but then you don't have the features of our build feature and also not of our reviews. But that's also something that you can do. Yeah, so that's actually what was my follow-up. If I could do this myself, like, is there any extra features that you guys have that I wouldn't be able to have? But it sounds like yes and no. Is, is that what I understand correctly? What you can do, you can host the open source package on your infrastructure. And what you would get with it is the hosting that we see that our clients set up usually only covers one build or one branch. So usually you set it up in a way that only once you have a new master build, then you have a new version of your uh, widget book also publicly available for your team to see. But with our builds feature, you have a new widget book build to check for all of your commits that you're doing in your repository. And basically, you do not need to take care of the hosting. I guess the question now is, and of course, we can go to your website and see it, but maybe we can talk a little bit about the pricing right now so people kind of know without having to take a look. The pricing, I think, is quite fair, right? I mean, what am I looking at as, say, like a solo developer versus a team of maybe five or less versus an organization that's quite big? Yeah, we have a usage-based pricing model, meaning we charge you per snapshot that is being created. So we basically have different tiers. So we have free tier that comes with 1,000 snapshots. And from there, we have three more tiers and that come with 10,000, 20,000, and 50,000 snapshots. And then we also have an enterprise tier that comes with a custom amount of, of snapshots. So we have some huge enterprises using Widget Book Cloud. And uh, yeah, they are producing a large amount of snapshots every month that exceeds 50,000. Can you actually clean up your snapshots so that way like you're not paying for stuff like, I mean, at the beginning of a project, I think there's probably going to be, you know, could be hundreds or at least tens of snapshots that maybe are not so useful for you. I mean, after years of working on the same project, you may not really care about old snapshots from years ago, etc. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. So basically there's a snapshot, there's a monthly snapshot limit. 
Oh, um, that see. resets every month. No need to worry about uh, legacy snapshots. Oh, okay. But do you actually keep the legacy snapshots in case I did want to check from a long time ago? Yeah, so basically we have a retention limit that also varies for the plan that you're using. It's all documented on the website. What's the retention period for every plan? Well, it's been a long journey to get from, you know, where we were where when we talked about it was that two years ago, or maybe even more than that. I can't remember how long it's been since we talked since we're on the episode. About two years ago. Yeah. So yeah. we started we started with a book early 2022. But even back then you were doing cloud stuff, or at least we're beginning on working on cloud. Like yeah. at a high level, it's like why did it take two years, right? Do you mind to kind of shed some light about why it took so long? And you know, yeah, I guess that's the big question. Why did it take so long? Because it seems like something should be simple, right? So we first of all started out building the open source package first. I mean, Widgetbook is an open source first uh, company and without a solid foundation, what need is the cloud? And that's why in 2022 and 2023, we just went all in for the open source package. And since uh, the open source package is very useful since summer, autumn, 2023, Afterwards, we could really re revamp Widgetbook Cloud. And that's what we've afterwards been focused on. What is like the next step, right? So now it's going public. I'm sure you have more ideas for more features. Is there anything that you can talk about, like for the upcoming milestones that may be coming out, maybe start to entice us to get on board now? Yeah, definitely. So there are many two things that are coming also pretty soon. So in our review feature, what we are doing there right now is we are analyzing your pull request and are finding out for you what changed visually. But we are only checking that for the default configuration of your widget right now. And with default configuration, I mean the first state of your widget that you can see when you're entering widget book. So basically, if you configure your widget book in a way that the first device that you're seeing is an iPhone 13. The first language that you're seeing is English. That the first theme that you're seeing is light mode and so on. And then we only take snapshots in these configurations. And then we can also only run our golden tests or our visual UI regression tests in this default configuration. But what we're adding now to Widgetbook Cloud is uh, what we call the multi-mode snapshots that we are basically allowing you to test your widgets in all the different configurations so all the different modes so that you are able to test all of your widgets on different device sizes on different languages in different themes and so on automatically on top of that our review feature right now is only supported for github so you can also already with all the other Git providers, use our hosting feature so that you can basically host your widgets on Widgetbook Cloud. But the review feature for now is GitHub only. And um, we, we just started working on including more Git providers. And um, we also already announced it with customers that have been eagerly waiting for that, uh, that we included in the early access programs already for uh, GitLab and Azure DevOps. I can imagine Azure DevOps as being a big one. I mean, a lot of people are using Azure, right? As you found out. GitLab for me is a huge one. I always use GitLab. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So it's going to be GitLab, Azure DevOps, and Bitbucket. So these are uh, the three Git providers that we see that our open source users are heavily using besides GitHub. So like the vast majority of our open source users is using GitHub. And that's why we went GitHub first. And now we're going to include the other Git providers as well. Oh, that's great. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention about Widgetbook or Widgetbook Cloud? Because it, I mean, it sounds pretty exciting. I'm looking forward to testing out myself finally. There's only one thing that we haven't covered for the review feature, and that is that we also have a Figma integration. So what you can do as well is you can link your Flutter widget to its original Figma design. And that is a feature that is especially useful for designers when using the reviews feature. And with that, we see that the collaboration between designers and developers has improved a lot. So to give you some customer testimonials here, our customers have been seeing that every designer and every developer working with Widgetbook Cloud can actually save 20% of their time due to the accelerated review feature. So you already have some testimonials. I mean, 
But are you putting these testimonials also on your site too to kind of promote this? Yeah, so we already have some testimonials on the website, but next week we're we going to change the website. What we focused on for this week was announcing the open launch so that the product is now finally in a very usable state. And mm -hmm. um, from now on, we're going to start boosting our marketing efforts. That's why next up is an improved landing page. And yeah, you're also going to see more and more social media activity from us. And with that, yeah, the testimony is going to be included. But if you, for example, check our announcement of the open launch, you can also already find customer testimonials on there. So what was for us very impactful last month at the FlutterCon conference, we, we have a talk about WidgetBook and we pre-selected three customers uh, that joined us on stage and they showcased how they've been using WidgetBook and how they could benefit from it. And yeah, from these customer presentations, I'm uh, taking that testimonial. That's great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to see the website. Do you know approximately which day it's going to be updated? It's definitely going to be live by the end of the week, but right. I can let you know. All right, great. Yeah, I mean, if there's nothing else, uh, it was great to have you back on. And uh, I'm happy to see, I think we mentioned before the show, it's like you were working on cloud for so long. It's a big update. It's a big thing you guys are finally you know, publicly releasing. But at the same time, it's like, well, actually, I've heard a lot about these features that we've talked about. So I understand that there's a lot of setup, a lot of things to, to get there, right? There's all the plumbing underneath probably was one of the biggest holdup because, I mean, what you see and what it takes to get there is like two different things. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, I mean, if you're building a developer tool and you're especially building something that no one built with that technology before, it's always difficult to predict exactly how long it would take. So we initially were also with, with some tasks, we were surprised that they uh, take longer than expected. With other tasks, they went quicker than expected. So it's always difficult when you're doing innovation, <laughs> something that hasn't been done before, you're doing it for the first time, can unfortunately take a bit longer. But what is then also crucial is basically the moment the product itself was usable versus the self-onboarding process being usable and basically all the stuff that is unrelated to just being able to simplify the review process for customers, but basically all the other infrastructure stuff that is important to properly get the customer there is also something that you need to keep in mind. Awesome. Yeah. Again, thanks for coming on and talking more about Witcher Book. You got me hooked again. So now I'm definitely going to be able to try, as I've said quite a few times this episode. You know me, if I find something I don't like or find something I want to know, of course, I'm going to come find you. So uh, expect to be hearing from me in these coming weeks. Yeah, awesome. Please, please do so. I mean, um, I know that you're already part of our Discord server. So um, yeah, please let me know what you think about the product. Sounds good. I'm looking forward to, widget, to the next things that you guys have come out, maybe Widget Book 4, 5, 6. Just don't be like Angular and some of these other things where you're going to go to like version 200 within two weeks, right? Don't be too crazy. No, no, no. no. I mean, that's something that we definitely don't do. And what I can already say, and we already have a pre-release on it for the open source package, there will be a fourth version of the open source widget book, but that's not something that you can expect within the next few weeks and months. So uh, that's basically kind of the end goal for widget book for the open source package. I mean, the product is never final and who knows yeah. what breaking changes the Flutter team might still uh, introduce. but for now, we believe Widget Book 3 will stay around for a few more months. And then there's Widget Book 4. Yeah, and then I don't think there's going to be a next version soon. Okay. Again, thanks for coming on. And uh, hopefully we'll have you guys on again. Great to see you again. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ellen.